Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I in turn will uh, point out what I think this side of the House uh, is under no obligation to prove. And that is that no system other than socialism, shall we say feudalism or slavery or uh, primitive hunter-gathering that we see in so many parts of Great Britain, um, <laughs> or, or even uh, the corrupt corporatism of contemporary Britain uh, fails to solve the problems that uh, socialism is uh, allegedly the solution to. All we have to do is to show that socialism does not solve the problems that it allegedly solves and uh, does so, uh, fails to do so because of its very intrinsic nature. There's something contradictory to its claims uh, that prevents it from producing the benefits uh, that are claimed for it. Now, the definition of socialism I will use is that of the Oxford English Dictionary, and it's the only definition, really, I think, that is uh, worth uh, debating. Uh, a theory, and it says that socialism is a theory or system of social organization based on state or collective ownership and regulation of the means of production, distribution, and exchange for the common benefit of all members of society. And that is to say, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, we're not debating social democracies such as Sweden or Denmark, uh, w which maintain their generous uh, social provision by a very efficient uh, private sector economy. Let us turn then uh, uh, to this uh, socialism in which the means of production, etc., are allegedly organized for the benefit of all members of society. The first thing to notice is that all members of any society may not agree what is beneficial, uh, certainly to them. Uh, this is not possible, and here I speak uh, from experience, is not even possible in a marriage, um, <laughs> let, in a, let alone in a society of many millions. In other words, conflict over desirable ends is irreducible except for an anchorite in the Syrian desert subsisting on locusts and honey. So the very idea of socialism is absurd from the start. You can only impose theoretical absurdity by force. If we turn to, uh, so those societies in which socialism as I defined it and as I say is the only way worthwhile to define it, um, was put into practice, namely the communist countries that are now almost non-socialist, with the exception of uh, Cuba and North Korea, there are no advertisements for socialism. And I hope I don't have to rehearse uh, the historical record of those societies, which has been almost universally disastrous from the first and from every possible angle. The record could be summarized as millions dead, freedom unknown, and nothing to show show for it. The reasons for the failure were intrinsic to the theory on which the practice was based. It was not just because a theory was applied wrongly that the people who were apply, applying this theory were somehow uh, foolish or weak or so on. I won't go into the economic inefficiency entailed under socialism by the virtual abolition of the pricing mechanism and the replacement of the impersonal allocation by price by allocation by political influence, which is obviously far more conducive to tyranny. Let me just remark instead on something that I think is so obvious that it takes considerable intellectual effort to avoid thinking about it. Uh, and it requires training in order to be able to uh, avoid thinking about it. When socialists talk glibly of organizing the economy, the organization of the economy for the benefit of all, there must be some organizer for the benefit of all, some philosopher, king, or kings who will do that organization. There are the organized and there are the organizers, and not much in between. And so there's no freedom, no spontaneity, and it is not, in my view, coincidental that not much in the way of innovation or invention ever arose in any socialist state. 
Tyranny and shortage, both organized and disorganized, is the natural result and were mitigated only by jokes on the one hand and black marketeering on the other, which was the, re, the re-establishment of, uh, of uh, a market. Human nature being what it is, the organizers do not and will never work for the benefit of everyone with selfless indifference to their own personal advantage. I once worked in a socialist country in Africa, Tanzania, where millions of peasants had been moved off, of course, by force from their land and herded into collectivized villages for the benefit of everyone, apparently, uh, and to the hosannas of socialists around the world. In short order, the country in which 90% of the population were peasants and there was no shortage of land could not even feed itself let alone produce anything for export. Indeed, by far, its largest uh, export was requests for emergency foreign aid. But you could tell the members of the organizing party, the party of the revolution, the Chama Chama Pinduzi, and you could tell them, very simply, by their girth. They were fat and the peasants were thin. We, on this side of the house, do not have to claim that man is only a selfish beast and inevitably acts red in tooth and claw in his own private interest. We do not believe that. No society has ever been like that. Socialists, however, tend to think that that is what people are like left to themselves, which is why they want to d- dragoon them in, their own, in the interests of society as a whole. Let me remind you of the opening words of the theory of moral sentiments by a man not often known for his socialist sentiment, namely Adam Smith. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. This is from the, uh, the uh, profit, if you like, of uh, economic freedom. It does not follow, however, from the fact that all of the people are altruistic some of the time, and some of the people are altruistic all of the time, that all of the people can be altruistic all of the time, which is what socialism requires for it to work. It never can be so, and therefore socialism does not and cannot work. Socialists, in my view, have always been and are fantasists. Marx thought (coughs) that when, under socialism, the division of labor was abolished, society would regulate the general production and thus make it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning to fish in the afternoon, to rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic. There is scarcely, Mr. President, a religious fantasy half so absurd, and you might as well make Hogwarts the blueprint for uh, British education. Mr. President, Socialism does not work because it cannot work. 